You know that I'm going to talk about food safety and security in the 21st century because hmm. let's go here. Why aren't my slides moving? Sorry, Michael, in the corner, in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see the slide advance. I can see your mouse moving around, so I know you have access. Right. In the bottom left-hand corner, there's a slide advance. Slide advance, bottom left-hand corner. Unless it's in your, uh, yeah, there, no. there you are. Oh, you were just there. Oh, there it is, slide. there it is, got yeah. it. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Uh -huh. So, um, this really is, is also a focus on looking at emerging issues in food safety locally, nationally, and globally, because I think it's important that we all recognize, and I'm sure we do, being in the food business, that foodborne illness is not a local issue. It is a global issue, and it's becoming more significant because of the, uh, in, the need to rely on global suppliers for our food supply. I want to talk about food, foodborne illness. I want to talk about in, in inadvertent and intentional contamination of food because these are two different approaches. And to, of course, when you talk about intentional contamination, we're talking about the threats and realities of food bioterrorism. And I'm not going to say a few words about that. I will. I also want to compare uh, two concepts, HACCP, hazard analysis and critical control points, and HART-C, which is how it, ha hazard analysis, preventative controls. They may seem to be the same, but there's a little difference. And then I want to talk a little bit, spend a little bit of time about, well, how do we work together to mitigate the risk? And I think that's been suggested um, earlier, that it's, we, it's, we live in a global society and we need to make sure that we work globally. Because foodborne illness is a very serious issue. Uh, people just don't get sick. We know that. People die. But when we look at the microbiological causes of foodborne illness, we're relying on data. In fact, CDC annual estimate, I'm sure you've seen these figures before, 9.4 million illnesses in the US, 128,000 hospitalizations, 3,000 deaths, which in view of what's going on today might seem like not very much, but it is significant. Nobody should die from eating food. But we're talking, these are incidents, but we talk about outbreaks that is two or more people they'd say that more than 800 outbreaks, 15,000 illnesses and 20 deaths in outbreaks. But it's not just the US. As they said, this is a global issue. And of course, being a Canadian, I have to bring in some Canadian data. The Public Health Association of Canada estimates 1.6 million illnesses from 30 known pathogens in Canada occurs annually. But then there are 2.4 million illnesses from unspecified agents. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But as I said, you know, it's not just the US and Canada, although we are close neighbors. But globally, and we're looking at 600 million people, or one in 10 worldwide, fall ill due to contaminated food each year. 420,000 die. Many of them are young children. This has got to be brought under control. The question is, how do we do this? Now, I am not a statistician, but the unfortunate thing is that we tend to rely on statistics to make decisions. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be using statistics. I'm just saying that we have to be careful of how we interpret the statistics. The science is there. And I do believe that we need, and I don't want to sound political, but I think it's important that we rely upon the science. 
but be careful about the statistics that you're reading. Because when we look at the reliability of foodborne statistical data, realize the majority of incidents are single cases. Now think about that. Because how do you investigate a single case? Most single cases are not investigated. So we get our, our information from outbreaks. Now there is a uh, program I don't know if you if you remember it, but a number of years ago on television, there's a program called um, Wisdom of the World, or Wisdom of the Crowd, sorry, Wisdom of the Crowd, in which they were making use of information technology to share information about outbreaks. Now this has, I know some loca locations have done this and it's being done in Toronto. The key is not to allow it to get abused because that's, a lot, that's reporting on individual cases. But that's a good way of finding out what is really going on. But the, the bottom line is, when we talk about foodborne uh, statistical data, we are talking about outbreaks. The problem with that is that by the time we get around to sorting it out, source attribution data is out of date. So when you see a report on, a, on an outbreak, it's usually weeks after the fact. Now the problem with most foodborne illnesses or foodborne contamination, if you will, is that it's inadvertent. Now we will talk about intentional, but for the most part, we have regarded foodborne contamination as being an inadvertent contamination as suggested by this cartoon, Beetle Bailey's says there's too much pepper in the soup and Sarge says, what do you mean I didn't put pepper in it? But, oh, wait a minute, what's hanging out of Sarge's mouth? Of course, we hope that nobody does that in a real kitchen, but you get the idea. It was not that intentional. But just because a food is contaminated, we have to realize where was this contamination occurring? It could occur I use the term naturally in source during harvesting. It could be inadvertently contaminated by cross-contamination, poor personal hygiene, inadequate sanitation process. Or it could be intentionally contaminated such as in fraud or bioterrorism. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We think about in the broad context of foodborne illness, particularly microbial foodborne illness, what are the pathogens of concern? And the, what's guided us up until recently, we've been looking at traditional foodborne pathogens, recognizing that there's a requirement, a time temperature abuse requirement to allow them to multiply. They may be producing uh, enterotoxins in food or, or producing exotoxins in the gut. But we have now moved in over the past few years. Certainly this was the, that situation when I was going through uh, college and, and in my early years, that was the traditional way we looked at it, time temperature abuse. But now we're seeing pathogens that have a very low infectious dose. And that creates major problems. We're also aware that there are food transmitted viruses and food transmitted parasites. So the concept of, of time temperature abuse as being the primary consideration is not. But just because a food is contaminated doesn't mean you're causing a food for illness. It has to be consumed. And it's consumed by, by a, a host who's susceptible and develops symptoms. And we know that the onset and severity of symptoms is due to the amount of food contaminated, the virulence characteristics of the organism, the infectious dose, and the, certainly the health status of the host, and that's an important consideration in this day and age. So when we look at the common bacterial pathogens, and neither one we're seeing, I would say, I hate to say it every day, but certainly on a weekly basis, Salmonella being one number one, Campylobacter jejuni, Listeria monocytogenes, and the, the whole gamut of endotoxigenic, endoadherent, endoinvasive E. coli, but now we have additional foodborne pathogens. And I'm not saying this is new, but endotoxigenic staph. 
And now we're finding not just Staphylococcus aureus, but Staphylococci per se. Botulism, Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium perfringens producing an enterotoxin. Bacillus cereus, which you don't hear too much about, but is, is a primary uh, related to production of enterotoxin. Your Sydney colitica, Vibrio perhemlinica, Vibrio species, and the list goes on and on as we learn more and more. But let's not forget the fact that there are parasites, Cyclospora, Cryptosporidium, possibly Giardia, although Giardia thinks you think of it as mainly as a waterborne parasite, realize that water is used in food production and certainly in food harvesting and preparation. It could contaminate the product. Then we have, of course, nematodes, cestodes, and treptodes that may be a problem not more in developing countries and uh, in sub Saharan countries than they are in North America. But we also have the issue of food transmitted viruses. And this really creates problems because we don't always have cultural techniques for finding viruses in food. We have Norwalk virus, which we, which we used to call winter vomiting disease. And we now know it's a major cause of illness on uh, cruise ships. But hepatitis, rotaviruses, caliche virus, adenovirus, astroviruses, coronaviruses can all be transmitted by food. However, COVID-19, I and mean, we have to say something about COVID-19, this being the uh, ninth month of the pandemic, there is no evidence of food or food packaging being associated with transmission. However, I think it's important to bear in mind that it's possible for somebody who touches the surface of or object of the virus and then where the virus is located and then touches their mouth, nose, or eyes that they could subsequently infect themselves. It's not necessarily directly from the food. It's a foodborne, but indirectly. But I think regardless, it's always critical to follow the key step of food safety that we've been talking about for years. Clean, separate, cook, and chill to prevent foodborne illness. Now, when we look at these inadvertent causes of, of these causes of traditional causes of foodborne illness, we have a concept that was developed in the 1960s by NASA to help protect astronauts in space from getting foodborne illness. Because I can't think of anything more, well, I shouldn't say that. But I don't even want to think about it. An astronaut in space throwing up or having diarrhea, not a pleasant concept. So in order to overcome that possibility, the HACCP program was developed by Pillsbury. And the hazard, the hazard program is a prevention focused food safety tool. It's looking at processes and trying to identify and monitor the hazards associated with those processes or that might be associated with that particular food. One of the key concepts of HACCP is the critical control point. And the CCP is a step in the process that you can control to prevent or eliminate a food safety hazard or reduce it to an acceptable level. This usually is reflective of a temperature issue, but it may not, but there may be others. But usually we talk about a critical control point often in the concept of temperature control. The idea, however, behind HACCP is that you build in safety and quality to each step of the process. And in fact, it's now mandatory for many companies to be HACCP certified to show that they are actually doing this. So critical control points, is that where we are? Well, as this cartoon says, anybody else think a critical control point is when the customer is adding a tip no, we know what a, we know what a critical control point is. It has nothing to do with tipping. It's all about food safety. And hasn't worked for a while, for many years. 
But unfortunately, we've progressed. We've gone from drift and absorb to shake and bake. And now simply having hazard is no longer enough because we have, we have to address many factors that contribute to the ongoing dilemma of continuous foodborne illnesses. We have new populations at risk. We have an aging society. You know, I had to laugh a number of years ago and I read CDC and it said, uh, old age starts at 55. But I said, wait a minute, I'm not old. And here I am right in the heart of that, being part of that aging society. But we also have medical practices and procedures that increase the number of immunocompromised people who are more susceptible. And of course, we know that even with COVID-19, although this is not about COVID-19, this is the same population that's most seriously affected by the coronavirus. We also have to deal with growing populations of overcrowding. When we think about the, the outbreaks that have occurred, certainly with norovirus on cruise ships, we're talking about people in crowded situations. But we have cities that, in which populations are growing, they're overcrowding, there's not enough separation. And it's interesting when you think about it, we've been talking about the importance of separation for COVID-19, but we also need to consider it also in terms of foodborne illness. But we are a very mobile society. We're exposed to a variety of risks. And uh, even in foodborne illness, as there is in COVID-19, it doesn't sound, sounds familiar, doesn't it? We have asymptomatic carriers, unsuspecting hosts, who could subsequently contaminate the food that is being consumed or being prepared and then being consumed. But one of the biggest problems we also have is the globalization of the food supply. You know, I can recall uh, in my younger days, I've got to be careful how I say this, in my younger days, we would go to the country, July and August. And I was looking forward to August because that was blueberry month and I could get blueberries from the local bakery. Well, guess what? I can get blueberries all year round. And they come from a variety of countries globally. But we also have, uh, as we've heard about animal husbandry and feeding practices uh, that, that help to contribute because of the uh, relationship of, of the animals and the crops and the feeding practices that go along with that. We also have to consider emerging lifestyle issues. We're, we're demanding extended shelf life of food. And certainly in this day and age, that's become a consideration. How long can we keep it? And realize that shelf life is not really a safety matter so much as it is a, a quality matter. We are, we were, see, I'm sure how old these slides are. We were eating outside the home a lot. We're not anymore. But still there are people who do like to eat outside, outside the home at, at um, in restaurants. We're also, because we are a global society, we experiment uh, with different cultural experiences and we may be exposed to foods that we have not had experienced before. But we also have to, in addition to those factors, we have changing eating habits. Think about this. The organic food movement, the raw food movement, local is safer the vegan food movement. I have uh, friends of ours who uh, will only buy organic food thinking it's safer. And I hate to change anybody's thought, but organic does not mean safer. And that's been demonstrated. But we also have people who are eating raw food and you have to say to yourself, really? Why would anybody expose themselves unnecessarily to a risk that we know exists? They're not listening to the science. You know, as I said, uh, in this cartoon says toxins in the food chain, but this is organically grown. Organically, as I said earlier, does not mean necessarily safer from a microbiological perspective. But you know, we are also dealing with misguided beliefs. 
there's this concept that if we sell, if farmers can sell directly to a consumer, they can assure food quality and safety, believing that if they don't, if the products aren't good, they're going to kill off repeat business. And also, you know, well, if we sell directly, the food passes through fewer hands with such direct sale. And so we can also improve food safety in that way. I would say bologna, but bologna is a food. And then, of course, of the five second rule. I don't know where this came from, but it doesn't apply. Hits the floor, don't, it doesn't mean it's not contaminated. Now, this is interesting because, as I was saying earlier about the farmers' uh, direct sales, in Maine, they've given a lot for local control over local foods to farmers. They exempt farmers from licensing and inspection. And they permit direct to consumer sale of raw milk, fruit juices, and home kit kitchen canned goods. Now think about the risk they're putting consumers, but thinking that it is a better approach to allow farmers to sell directly without, ins without inspection. then there are those who will sell uh, let me go on but sorry there are also companies that sell raw water in 2012 may in maine i'm not and i'm not picking out maine forgive me i'm not but this is just an example that i use tourmaline springs sells raw water for $2.99 a liter. Why would anybody expose themselves to unnecessary risk? But they think because it is bottled, it is safe, even though it's not untreated. And of course, as I said, I'm not picking on Maine, but in California, they sell untreated spring water under the name, I love it, Fountain of Truth. I don't think it's being totally truthful. So now we have to look at other emerging food issues because now we're seeing new reservoirs of contamination, dwindling supplies of uncontaminated water. We're also aware, as I mentioned before, the enhanced virulence characteristics, the low infectious dose of various organisms, they seeing genetic mutation, and we're also aware that virulence factors are capable of being transferred, particularly amongst the, uh, in the microbial world. And as we've heard already, there's an invasion and destruction of established ecosystems, and we are being exposed to organisms that we were never exposed to before. And that causes significant harm. But when I talk about the changing landscape of at-risk foods, you know, at one time we thought, well, milk, eggs, poultry, yeah, that's the important ones. Wait a minute, what about peanut butter? Peanut butter, really? Spices? Dried cereal? Produce, yes, we recognize the risks of such produce. And of course, sprouts, you ask any microbiologist or food safety expert what food they would not eat, and that's the one the vast majority will tell you sprouts because they are notoriously contaminated with salmonella. I'm not going to get into why, but just let's say that that's a major concern. Then you have outbreaks associated with norovirus in frozen raspberries and strawberries that are a public health risk in Europe. And then you've got people who also eat raw pet food. I'm sorry, but not a good idea. Recently, there have been outbreaks or contamination associated with cyclospora in bagged salad mix. We've seen uh, uh, people sick due to the consumption of onions. There was an outbreak of salmonella in bagged peaches. These are things that I have never seen before, certainly not in onions or bagged peaches. Salad mixes, yes, but certainly not onions and bad peaches. 
So you can see how the landscape is changing. And again, I'm going to repeat, there is no relationship, no evidence of food or food transmission of COVID-19 from food packaging to food. But what we do have as a concern is about food bioterrorism. In fact, the World Health Organization says that the malicious contamination of food for terrorist purposes is a real and current threat. And realize that the deliberate contamination of food at one location could have global and public health implications. And I, and I want to stress this, that what, a, what contamination occurs at one location can affect many. What issues affect one company's production can reflect on others, and not directly, but indirectly. Because when consumers read about a contamination problem, they don't look at who the manufacturer is necessarily, they look at the product type. And so it's important, and I think I'll, I'll say this now, but I will probably repeat this, it's important that we work together to resolve these issues and share information. Now, Aberin, it's interesting, is a poison being experimented with by terrorists. It's a natural poison derived from seeds. And it's interesting, we've had this issue in Canada where someone has sent seeds, we're not sure from what country, to a number of people in Canada. Hopefully they haven't eaten it. But the seed, and I'm not saying they're, uh, these are the seeds that are being sent, but this is one approach that is being used with, with this particular purified toxin. It's similar to ricin. It causes death within 36, within 36 to 72 hours of exposure, depending upon the root of exposure. It's, a, it's a agreed or believed that it will never be a weapon of mass destruction, but you don't need mass destruction. How about mass disruption? Where people start to second guess what is safe and what is not. So aberrant scenarios are likely to involve a small number of victims, but could cause panic in the marketplace. The FBI believes that food terrorists may target the food sector and believe it'll be more likely than my wolf, lone wolf attacks more likely to happen. And these targets include food processing facilities, food storage and distribution, restaurants, grocery stores and markets, commercial facilities and cruise lines. And we've seen evidence where not necessarily a terrorist act, but certainly a, a in the traditional concept, but for people who actually contaminated foods in grocery stores directly. But when we think about the importance of food bioterrorism, it's not necessarily a mass outbreak. Because there, there could be it could be physical. You can get illness or death. But more importantly is the psychological, the fear factor or panic that it could introduce and what impact that would have on the healthcare system, on lab services and hospital services, on healthcare providers. And of course, one of the main concerns is what, what impact would it have economically on the agriculture and food service system and the stock market, if in fact a food commodity or food commodities were contaminated and it became generally known. One of the things that uh, as a number of people are concerned about is the insider threat. That is an individual who works in an environment but who exploits that position and has access to means, processes, equipment, material within that organization and could therefore contaminate it if they wish. So the likelihood of an employee becoming an insider threat increases with a variety of personal factors. Think about, does this person have financial need? Do they have, are they, look, do they have feelings of anger or revenge? Are they a sympathizer with terrorist ideology? Are they having problems at work? Are they compulsive? Is there compulsive and destructive behavior, including their ego? I'm not gonna get, I am not gonna get political. Other family issues. 
I guess important thing, and I don't want to cause people to be, uh, how should I put it, unfairly uh, posing, pointing fingers. But if you're in a facility and you're aware of some strange activity related, that could be related to an insider threat, you need to let somebody know so that they can actually address the issue directly before it becomes part of the problem. So everybody has to take responsibility, keep their eyes open. And one of the ways you can do it, do you see anybody taking pictures? Are they attempting to gain information about company operation? Do they conduct surveillance of self-service areas? Are they in shipping areas that un where unscheduled deliveries arrive? Or you, there's a driver who is unfamiliar with the facility and delivery protocols. So look for behavior that is suspicious and make sure that it gets addressed. Now the WHO believes that outbreaks of both unintentional and deliberate foodborne diseases can be managed by the same mechanism. I beg to differ. Although they think that sensible precautions coupled with strong surveillance and response capacity is the most efficient and effective way of countering all such emergencies, I think it has, including food terrorism, I think misses the mark. Because I don't think that's, I personally don't think that's enough. Because I think what you need to have is not just hassle, but you need to have heart seat. It's a hazard analysis, risk-based preventative control. And if you look at the Food Safety Modernization Act, you will see that it has a long run covered. Now, Harp C was originally introduced to mitigate strategies to protect against intentional adulteration, but it can also be used in a food for food terrorism purposes and also for food safety generally. And this is really the focus of my presentation that I've been giving you. We need to be talking about prevention. You know, we, we need to talk about operational risk management and how do we control uh, everything that's going on within a plant. We need to be able to manage the risk of food bioterrorism through risk analysis, risk ass assessments, making sure we tell people what's going on enhancing our HACCP and HARPC programs and having a food security plan in place. And I'm gonna skip through these plans because there are food defense plan builders that are available online. And you can see here that uh, FDA has a uh, site you can go to, to get information. There are preventative steps that you can take for making sure that everyone is aware of what the risks are and have and how to control it and prevent it. You can challenge your food defense program in a variety of ways. This was this, whoops. I apologize. There's a guide to protecting and defending food from deliberate attack published by the British Standards Institution. So there are a variety of, of uh, issues out there that, help you can, that will help you do that. So, I want to go to do Food Safety 101 for me. We've talked about a lot of related issues or interrelated issues. And I, uh, I'm not going to sing this to you, but with due respect to the sound of music, I think it's important that we start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. And the first three notes just happen to be P I P. And I think it's important that we keep that in mind no matter what area of the food business we're in. Prevention, intervention, and protection. Prevention number one, intervention number two, and protection number three. 
So what's wrong? How do we prevent contamination in the field? Contaminate, we know that agricultural water could be contaminated, so it means we have to treat the water before we use it. What about for birds and other animals? There's very little way we can protect product, produce, the crops grown in the outside. The only way to do is grow them in greenhouses. We have to look at the ineffectiveness of innovation strategies during processing, production, and packaging and distribution. And the other thing is that we're making decisions based on unreliable baseline data. When you think about the heterogeneous distribution of contamination in food, what we are looking at when we do sampling is such a small amount of what is actually there. I think it's important that we start to use our intelligence as well. If it seems like the right thing to do, let's do it. So we need to develop a food safety culture. But we've heard this many times before. We need to educate and train all employees at all levels. We have to communicate. We have to have measurable food safety goals. And there need to be clear consequences for food safety, both positive and negative. It starts at the top. Make sure that everyone recognizes food safety as the priority. That it, there's no room for underhanded practices. Take pride in maintaining high food standards and be willing to do the right thing even without supervision. People shouldn't be looking over their shoulders to see if anybody's watching. It should be the right thing to do. Now the Food Safety Modernization Act addresses some of these issues. It talks about preventative controls for human food and for animal food, and it talks about mitigation strategies to protect food from intentional alteration. But in order to comply with rules one and two, you need heart C. Because it's, we're talking about prevention. I'm going to skip through these. One of the things that we want to be careful of is that when people go in to a store to buy food, they have good choices. Not just foods that are bad for you or foods that are really bad for you. Because that, in fact, it seems to be what's happening. There's no guarantee of safety in some areas. We're taking chances, and that shouldn't be. So how do we reach this elusive goal of ensuring that we are providing consumers with safe food? How do we inculcate a food safety culture? Oh, I'm sorry, what's going on here? Everyone must take responsibility. It's not up to the government bodies, it's not up to science, it's up to everyone to do this. The federal government has responsibility, definitely, to make food safety decisions based on science. Now I said at the outset, I'm not gonna get political, but science is where you get, make is the basis for making safety decisions. It's important that government implement stringent and enforceable specification for the safety of irrigation water because it is a key element in food processing, whether in the field or in the plant. And one of the things that, that I am concerned about personally is the post-processing treatment. I'd like to see government approve and encourage irradiation and other post-processing food treatments to ensure that the food that is going out of the plant is in fact safe to consume. There have to be technologies for pest control, pathogen control, and extending the shelf life of produce. But it's the federal government can also harmonize performance standards for food processing and analysis with other countries. Too often, our governments are standing alone and developing performance standards or what is the expectations in isolation. We cannot do that. We cannot afford to do that. We have to work together. And through, certainly through ISO and AOAC International, these are groups that are doing harmonization of performance standards. The federal government can also continuously educate the public. It's important that the messages get out And it's important, I think, the federal government can all not to be totally reliant 
on statistical data to assess the impact of intervention strategies. Some intervention strategies just make good common sense and you don't need statistical data to tell you that it's good common sense to do what you're doing. But one of the most important things the federal government can do, and this goes across the board, is be consistent in the message of consumers. There's nothing worse than giving consumers mixed messages because then they don't know what to listen to or who to believe. You know, here's FDA and EPA. I'm sure I use that as an example. Anything but meat or anything but vegetables, or what do you choose? Be consistent. But state and local public health agencies also have a responsibility. They need to encourage uh, actions that focus on preventing foodborne disease. Now, there's, a, there's a publication called Control of Steering Monocytogenes and Ready to Eat Food. It is applicable to both pathogens. There needs to be an emphasis on environmental monitoring to prevent cross-contamination. You need to find and eliminate the source and take appropriate corrective action. You need recommendations for controls involving personnel cleaning, maintenance of equipment, and sanitation. Now, when you think about it, most food companies, their sanitation practices happen at night, not during the day, for very reasonable reasons. But we cannot turn a blind eye to our sanitation and cleaning requirements for our equipment and our services. So food industries. Make sure that they choose only suppliers that use food safety best practices. You know, we have individual companies, but they need to share food safety solutions. They need to make food safety a core part of company culture. Don't just say, well, this is what the law requires. Go above and beyond what the law requires. Implement scientifically validated and regulatory approved food safety intervention strategies. And in this regard, one of the things that foods industries must do is develop a supply chain management system that works for them where they have a good relationship with their suppliers. But there are also scientific responsibilities. And as a scientist, I'll tell you, we, we need to have global harmonization and local methods validation. Too often now, a method used in in the United States is not the method that is used in Canada or that's used in Brazil or that's used in China. We need to harmonize the validation of the method, not necessarily the methods themselves, so that the answers we're getting are comfortable. I think accreditation of labs to international standards of performance is really a good thing because the third party assessment of how the lab reliability and trustworthiness of the lab. We also need to certify analyst competency because they're the ones who are doing the work. But it's also important that we cooperate and share data. Too often, scientists retain the data independently. It's important, as in everything, as even with food companies, that we cooperate with each other and share the data. And again, give consistent messages to consumers. Otherwise, they won't know who to believe. Even the best science, the people are giving different messages of consumers will be confused. But you know, it's not just government, it's not just scientists, it's the individuals who also have responsibilities. It's important to focus on the children, teaching poor personal hygiene, basic food sanitation. I gave a lecture at a kindergarten class a number of years ago about hand washing. And I said, you know, it's, it's the 22nd rule, but I know that kids are not gonna count to 20. So I said, why don't you sing a song while you're washing your hands? And I said, let's sing Old MacDonald Had a Plan or Happy Birthday. And they did this and it worked. And then a couple of weeks later, I had my nephew call me up and say, can I sing something else other than Happy Birthday? <laughs> I said, pick whatever song you like. But it's important that we start with the children because they have minds like, like sponges. It also helps to habitualize food safety practices. If you're constantly have to reminding people what to do, it's not a habit. People have to do it because it's a habit and it's innate. And that's how you develop a food safety culture. And again, people need to listen to the science 
But what are the signs telling them? One of the biggest problems we have, of course, is social media, which spreads false information about other things, but also about food safety. And if people should not be looking at social media for information, they should be looking at the scientists and scientific studies. It's also important as individuals that we practice what we preach. We walk the talk. And I do this with my friends. I keep them posted and notified of the foodborne food recalls and foodborne outbreaks. I have a, what I call a food advisory group. And I think, you know, here's a cartoon that I love because this is what people often do. I, I say we do it and freaking knows be damn. Why would you consume something though? that you might, that, that you suspect is in fact dangerous. Well, I think of things like raw pet food or raw milk. This is one that's a new one for me. It's not really a food, but this came up a couple of years ago where the teens were ingesting laundry detergent. And what was dubbed, dubbed the Tide Pod Challenge. Please, I thought teenagers had more brains than that. But there are some doing something where you're totally ignoring the risk. So I'm gonna conclude this. I'm gonna tell you that every foodborne incident represents a failure of our food safety programs. Every food recall represents a failure of our intervention strategies. Investigation is too late. It's after the fact. Prevention is the key. And I believe that I've come to the end of my presentation, so I thank you very much.